Welcome back everybody to another Chess Tips video. In this series, I try to break down certain concepts for you by giving you examples that you can then implement in your own games. Doesn't matter whether you're a beginner, intermediate, or an advanced chess player, there will be something for you. Today we're gonna talk about counterplay, which is essentially a concept in chess where you try to put some pressure on your opponent from a worse position. That might mean you're down material, that might mean your position is just passive. Let's jump in. We've got a handful of examples, all from games that I've played here on chess.com. The first one, actually the first two examples today, are going to be about activating your pieces. And feel free to look at the video player. I've broken up timestamps of what concepts are at what time. Activating your pieces. I had this position uh, against an FM uh, actually just a few days ago. And you'll notice that I've got a big clamp here. I've got a pawn chain that's dominant. I'm completely locking down the queen side. This bishop is staring into this territory. But here my opponent played the move knight g6, activating his piece. Now both knights eye this, uh, this square. And my opponent is actually up two pawns, but I'm the person who, for a, mo for, for a, for a moment there, was going to have the better position because I had pressure on both sides of the board and everything was locked down. But now all of a sudden this is coming. So here I played the move queen c1, which supports my pawn uh, and threatens to push. Actually, if I push the pawn, the queen's just trapped because of how dominant my position is. And my opponent stops my threat. It's important not to just get tunnel vision. You also have to ask yourself, what does your opponent want? Why did he play queen c1? He wanted to push, so he puts the queen right, right there. I play knight g3, offering a trade of knights. He brings the knight to f4, making me move away. And now a question for you. How does black activate another piece? You can pause if you'd like to think about it. Black here plays the move bishop f6. And his intention, which becomes clear in a few moves, I hear him really trying to trade pieces. He brings in the second knight. He plays the move bishop to g5. And now the bishop, the knight, are threatening things on my queen. For example, this check doesn't work normally, but right now he would be opening up the bishop to the queen and that would be decisive. And at this point, my opponent should have kept his focus on this side of the board, something like knight h3, for example, you know, just to get this bishop out of the game. It's a very powerful piece. It cuts the entire board. And, you know, for example, if I play queen takes f2 here, uh, I've got control this way, uh, but my opponent can even offer a queen trade. You know, the more pieces my opponent gets off the board, the better. He uses the counterplay to get pieces off the board uh, and then trade pieces, because at the end of the day, my opponent is up two pawns. But my opponent here did something that you shouldn't do. He tried to create counterplay on both sides of the board. And that just backfired. And it backfired because I immediately swarmed on the queen side. And again, his position was stretched too thin. He created a weakness, and I was actually the one that was able to get back into the game. By activating his pieces, he should have kept his focus on this side and continued to chip away. This opponent, I actually played a few games. So the very next game, my opponent played the move f5, sacrificing a pawn so that his bishops can line up toward my king, and I have this sort of situation on the board. Now, again, we're talking about activating pieces. Here, I can move my, my knight back, but that's not going to be good. He's just going to continue to stockpile pressure. I can also take his bishop, but my logic for not doing this was that I'm trading off my only active piece. It's not like I can go here, because he just takes. So I didn't really like that. I felt like my bishop and my knight were still passive. And instead, I played knight to d4. And my logic here was that if he takes me, now I continue to create threats. So activating your pieces. Yes, I do have a little bit of a threat to go knight to b3. So he plays bishop b1. That's bait. Knight b3 doesn't work because then he will move his queen. These two pieces threaten checkmate. And my knight is hit. Excuse me, my knight is hit. So I can't take his rook anymore. He plays this move, bishop b1. Now, again, we're talking about activating pieces. How does black activate a piece here? Like you, can you have to create counterplay. So how does black activate a piece here and create a threat? With the move knight c5. So I've, now I'm actually trying to activate a second piece and get into this territory. Now, both of the queen's squares are taken, and he can't actually create the battery to my king. So my opponent plays knight e2. And here I saw a nice combination, but at the end of the day, it's not about necessarily the combo. It's about the fact that uh, excuse me, my opponent has got very active pieces and I need to keep kind of pace with him. So here, I play knight b3. And we say, well, Levy, you just said, you know, he's going to go here. And even though the rook's in danger, he's the one threatening a mate. 
Yes. But now, because we've activated a piece, we have extra tactical possibilities. And the move e4. Blocking the queen from giving mate. And if he takes, here I have the move f5. I also can take the, the, the knight right away with check. During the game, I hadn't seen what to do here. Because I thought, well, he's just threatening mate and the knight is hanging. But I had this, and I can allow him to check me. And if he takes the knight here, I have the move rook e8. And the queen is stuck. Yeah, basically, he can take or go here. But the, because the bishop is the only thing protecting the king, I just break through. I just did, I didn't see that. It was a blitz game. Uh, and so I decided that I was going to play e4. This, this protects that square, so no check. And then I take, and then I take the rook. And a little tactical flurry later, I'm up a rook and he's no longer checkmating me. And we only were able to create this counterplay by activating our pieces. And so, this takes me to the next example. Uh, I was playing this Grandmaster in a Blitz game, and the opening was a disaster. I made a mistake, and I had to play bishop e7 and bishop f8 to protect against this. He's got very active pieces. He's not letting me castle this way. So, now we're not talking about activating pieces anymore. We're actually talking about uh, chopping away at your opponent's um, active pieces and looking for a timely break in the position. So a moment where you can break through to create some counterplay. So you'll notice that obviously I, I try to castle as fast as possible and my opponent plays bishop e3. Fully developed, bishops are solid. Uh, I'm not gonna have some crazy piece activation here. So instead I bring the bishop back and I start to trade off his active piece. I do that successfully. Now this, this bishop trade is up for grabs, and that would have been good for me, but my opponent played bishop b5. Now in this position, uh, there is one move, which is black's best move. It's the best move to create counterplay, create counter chances, and no longer have such a passive position. It's a break. When I say break, you should be thinking of a certain piece. You should be thinking on break, d5. And my opponent in the game took this pawn. And I had foreseen that even though I can't take because of the pin, I'm creating enough counterplay in the center of the board that it doesn't really matter. He plays queen takes e4, uh, and here I missed a really nice idea. I could have played bishop d5, queen d3, and the move queen h7. Maintaining vision here, and both queens protect the knight, but now this is a threat because I'm no longer pinned. In the game, I simply offered a trade of queens, and then he blundered a bishop. So my opponent just completely inexplicably forgot that he was no longer pinning me, and I won a bishop, I went on to win the game. But at this point, Black's position is already completely fine. Because I'm no longer passive, I traded off his active pieces, and I created some serious counterplay. This next game is not going to be about creating a break. The next example is going to be about... Actually, the next two examples are going to be uh, creating counterplay to the enemy king. First, we'll start with this example. Uh, I was playing a Blitz game against an FM, and I obviously have a solid positional advantage. I have a lot more space. Um, I've got a bind on his pawn structure. My knight is about to jump in. And here I notice that after bishop f5, I can give a check, and my opponent can go to either direction, but he will lose a pawn due to tactical reasons. And I saw that I could take. He takes this way. This is hanging. And in the game, if he had taken with this, then this picks up a pawn this way. So he played gf5, and I just took this pawn. I didn't even, uh, you know, free pawn. Gotta take it. But now my opponent plays a move, creating counterplay on my king, rook d8. And in the game, he then activated his knight this way, a5, because he, he, he couldn't do it this way because of my pawn. So he activates his knight, and I was looking to trade. But it got so bad in the game that he actually missed a winning opportunity. He kept bothering me. He activated all his pieces. And right here, he missed the win. He could have played takes, takes, and not takes, but give me a check first. And if I try to protect both pawns, it's an illusion. It's not actually protected. Because if I take it, he has this. Now he's suddenly winning two pawns for the cost of losing one originally, and I'm in big trouble. So he could have played like this, and he just didn't see that. And he took like this, and that allowed me to create some consolidation, get it into a, you know, night end game, and then go on to win. This next example 
is not about creating little counterplay to the king. It's about going all out. This is going to be the most fun example of the day. Uh, I was playing this, this FM from Poland. I think that's Poland, right? Totally Poland. And at this point, I was down two pawns from the opening, and I decided to go a little crazy. He gave me this check. I could have protected with my queen. I said, nah, take my rook. And there's going to be games that you're down material. E5. Creating counterplay down the center of the board because there's a king right there. My opponent gave me a check, but he didn't actually realize that he's trapping his own bishop. He can't check me with the queen. I'm so bad at drawing arrows today. And then, in this position, I didn't even take. I don't want his knight to get developed. So I stayed patient, I took a pawn. Now his knight can no longer develop, the queen covers that square. And then, even though he got two pawns, now it's four pieces playing versus a queen. And that's exactly how the game went. Even though I was down material, my four pieces played the rest of the game. I mean, he just never got to move his pieces. Literally. He never got to move his pieces. And I just kept bothering him with mine and slowly brought my rook back. And I ended up winning the game. And the final position, those pieces never moved. So even though he was up a rook in the middle game, I created enough threats to his king that he never got two pieces into the game. That is how you create counterplay when you're down a lot of material. For this next game, it's still about creating counterplay by attacking and activating your pieces, but it's a little bit less crazy. I had this position against an IM, and he played the move knight f6, just developing. At this point, it should come as second nature. How do you start your counterplay in this position? Understand that black is a few moves away from getting comfortable, so come up with something. Now, I'll, you can pause here, you can think about it. So I'm going to tell you this. It is not the move e5. It is also not the move bishop takes f6. Why are you trading pieces for what? Why are, e5 makes a little bit more sense, but you can just stop the thought right there because now nothing has changed. If anything, you opened up your opponent's bishop, then knight is extremely strong, but I understand if you think that e5 is the right move. Like, it, it, it you know, you were thinking, I need to activate, I need to do some damage with my pawn. The right move is not e5. The right move is rook c1, and try to get down to c7 to pressure the bishop and go win this. Activate your most valuable piece. Now we see the other idea. If my opponent castles, the knight is protecting the bishop and not the king. So now you would take, and the difference is, now you win a bishop. Before, you don't make that trade because it doesn't do anything. So that's what happened in the game, and my opponent backed up, and I just kept my rook here. And even though he defended himself, I took now... Because when he takes back, I play knight c4. He still cannot castle, and now I have a new target. Now in the game, he just blundered. He played here, and I won some pawns, and I just won all his pawns, <laughs> and I went on to win. Of course, that didn't have to happen. Uh, let's back up. Uh, after knight c4, he can also play something like king to e7, but then I bring the second knight. <laughs> and I just have way more active pieces than he does. Even though I was down one pawn, now I'm threatening knight c6. How does he even stop that? Look, I'll give you an example of what it can turn into. Check, here, check. Here, and I take the bishop. I can actually have a choice. I have a choice of which bishop to take. So it's all about activating your pieces and not letting your opponent feel solidity. For the last example, I'm going to show you a position from the rating climb. I'm doing the rating climb series. When I start at 800, I play against subscribers, uh, Twitch subscribers, but you're, you know, feel free if you're just watching on YouTube to check out those climbs. We do them live basically every day. I had this position with the white pieces against an 1100 rated player. And in the game, he did this. He castled and I started an attack on his king. I actually sacrificed the piece, started a big attack, and I ended up winning the game. But here, my opponent could have actually started counterplay himself. He's down a pawn. He doesn't have a great position. He should have played the move g5. And on bishop g3, he can continue to create counterplay on this side of the board. First of all, he can play a move like this to just, excuse me, I'm so bad at arrows today. Pressure my center and then play like knight f5, h5, and so on. Or something, for example, like rook g8. The engine won't level move like rook g8 because now it thinks that white is going to be the one attacking. But your point is this. If white plays a slow move, now you play h5, h4, g4. You're creating counterplay. You're not just sitting there going, hmm, what's a solid move that doesn't do anything uh, but, you know, also doesn't blunder? No, put pressure on your opponent. So e even in my rating climb series, there are moments that my opponents can play certain ideas that are very, very strong. And if they play them, then great. It's going to be a really competitive game. But 
hopefully this uh, you know this video inspires you to create counterplay in different ways, activating your pieces, attacking, just going crazy, all out, not giving up and not just sitting there and playing passive moves. Anyway, let me know what other concepts for the chess tip series you'd like me to add. Sometimes you guys write like random things. Like, hey, Levy, make a openings series, you know. Let's try to keep suggestions and chess tips videos primarily to chess tips. What concepts you'd like to see me cover. I already have a few ideas, but I'll come up with more. If you like the way I teach, you want to pick up an openings course, there's a link in the description. And as always, join our community. We have over 8,000 people in the Gotham City Discord. You can talk to other people about chess, food, life. I mean, that's the only thing that really exists anyway. So take a look at that as well. Uh, and I will see you in the next video.